Hello, and welcome to Episode 2 of the Maine Perspective Podcast Series 2021. I'm your host, Dee Dixon, owner and publisher of Pride, Charlotte's African-American magazine, and co-founder of the Women's Intercultural Exchange, or WIE. We will focus on wealth creation within the Black community throughout this podcast series. Why? Because the need for Black Americans to build generational wealth is urgent. The inequities resulting from slavery and a plethora of other deep systemic economic policies have created a racial wealth gap that cannot be denied. According to a 2019 racial wealth gap study here in Charlotte by the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute, nearly one in three black households have a zero net worth. I say zero net worth. In addition, 44% of black households lack sufficient savings for basic needs beyond three months. Now, with these statistics in mind, today's discussion will be about the black family and the racial wealth gap. I will be in conversation with Jay and Alicia Wallace-Smith, a Charlotte couple who have been married for 27 years and who moved to Charlotte in 1990. Jay and Alicia, welcome, and thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Thank you, Dee. Thank you. All right. So now before we get into the meat of today's topic, let's share with our listeners a little background about both of you and your marriage. So let's start with you, Jay. Tell us a bit about yourself, where you grew up, and what your childhood was like, and what you do for a living now. Um, Well, I grew up in Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I went to Ohio State. Um, As far as childhood to Ohio State, it was pretty normal. I had a mother and father at the house. Um, Typical family. I was the youngest of eight kids, so. Eight? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a big family. It was younger than kids. Yes, so. yes. So um, it's pretty typical. I mean, go yeah. to the school yeah. and everything. So, what do you do now for a living? Um, I write software. Mm. I write software at Bank of America. Okay. Um, How long have you been doing that? Actually, since um, college, I did okay. it at college, and then I continued on, um, started doing contract work, and then I came, um, came to um, work at Ohio State, and mm-hmm. then I came here on a contract. Okay. Okay. All that sounds pretty normal there. So, (laughs) Alicia, what about you? Tell us a little bit about your background and what you currently do. Um, I often refer to myself as as a bit of a vagabond. I'm the daughter of of a truck driver, two-parent household, Uh, had a pretty large family that grew over time. Uh, But I I was lucky enough to experience uh, growing up in Los Angeles, Detroit, Ohio, and Segway down to Arkansas, Whoa. came back to Ohio. <laughs> That's where I met Jay, what we met while we were at Ohio State. And then uh, we moved here in 96. Okay. So uh, that is awesome. You are a vagabond. I mean, <laughs> a lot of diversity there. Wow. Which, which city did you like the best? Well, you know what? Charlotte is where I really call okay. it home. I've been here longer than anywhere else. Okay. Now, did you tell me what you were doing, what your occupation is now? I work in healthcare. Okay. I've worked in healthcare for over 20 years. I uh, have touched on everything from donor recruitment for the National Marital Donor Program and the American Red Cross to working with Life Share of the Carolinas and Atrium Health and now a consultant. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, I can't wait to get into some of these questions. So I start with this. Now, you've been married, I hear, or you've told me about 27 years, right? I say to you, congratulations <laughs> on that. I only made it to 10 years in my first marriage and five on the second. I'm done. You're so, done? Oh, my. Yeah, you all are doing well. So tell us a little bit about where you met. I think you said in college, and just give us some background about that. And what, what made you guys decide to get married? Was it love or something else? I don't know. Love at first sight, whatever. Well, I don't. I don't know how to answer that as far as um, for Jay, but I can say that 
uh, Ohio State, if, you, if you've ever been on that campus, it's a super large campus. It's got two zip codes and every kind of, every kind of college on, on site. But uh, I actually m met him climbing up my apartment building to help my, uh, my neighbor <laughs> who, who was locked out of her apartment. Okay. And okay. he was climbing in a suit. <laughs> I said, God bless her. So that must have been love at first sight. Or what? Well, I mean, uh, that was interesting. <laughs> so from your perspective, uh, Jay, so how, how, you know, what made you two get married? And how did you connect climbing up in that suit? Did you see her and say, wow, that's it for me? Is that Well, I was in network marketing. And obviously when I saw her, it was, you know, you'd say, wow, that's, um, that's somebody I'd like to get to know. And so, you know, as, as we got to know each other, um, from a personality perspective, very different from anybody I've ever ever met. Um, very go get it type of personality. Um, uh, I guess you almost look. Some people look for their opposite, mm -hmm. but I think I look for someone as aggressive as I was at that time. Okay. And so. Oh, yeah. great! So, did you all date a, a long time, or you know what? What led you to think that you would make a good couple, you need to get married well, we, and settle down? We were really good friends at first. I mean, okay. And okay. so it, mm -hmm. and she liked some of the same things I liked, like sports. Yeah. We talked about money. We talked about our future, even while we were just friends. So okay. it just made it easy um, to do, do, do you agree with that? You know, because... <laughs> yeah, he was a little corny at first. He was a little corny. He was a little corny. Okay, now little corny so we want to get but, down but, to the real deal Because, because again, I told you he was climbing in a suit. But, um, <laughs> but, but he, he, he kept coming around, and, yeah. and my friends kept saying, you know, that, I think that guy likes you. And so we, we, had, we built a friendship, yeah. and we also were very similar in, in a lot of the things we aspired towards. So it, it was... It was a, a heavenly thing, I think. It okay. was a godly, okay. godly intersection. Well, that, that sounds great, uh, unusual, but great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's dive in. So I stated earlier that one in three black households in Charlotte have zero net worth. Zero net worth. So to what do you attribute this to? And let's be frank, does your household fall into this category? Why or why not? So first of all, what do you contribute this lack of net worth to? Who wants to start? I'll be glad to. Um, okay. I, I think that historically we've never been given a, a whole lot of education about building wealth. We, we, we see the fairy tale. We see the Disney stories. We see the television version. But we don't have the same educational intersection or, or information provided to us about uh, why should you buy a house? Or once you get a house, how do you keep it? Or uh, what are those features, the, the 401k, and, and, and how do I use that? And what is this company matching? We were talking about that on the way over here. It's just we didn't have that for training that many of our counterparts who happen to be white have had. Mm -hmm. Their parents were taught. Mm -hmm. Their parents were able to pass on anything that they accumulated. They were able to maximize insurance mm -hmm. so that their, their families could survive if they were no longer here. And that's not how we've been been taught. Right, right. right. And so I, I'm glad to say we don't fall in that one in three category, mm -hmm. but it came out of the history of, I know for certain my parents, my parents were great at getting a place, but they couldn't manage yeah. to keep it for anything. Right, right. And they didn't understand how to manage credit, mm -hmm. build credit, and mm -hmm. what the value of that was beyond getting the next car. So we were get good at getting things, but mm -hmm. we were not good at holding on to them. Right, right. And when both of them passed, and I took care of both of them uh, th through the end of their mm -hmm. lives, mm -hmm. they had nothing. Yep, yep. I, I understand that because... Um, I know I grew up in Statesville, a place you need to be leaving. Um, and, you know, my, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I didn't know anything about owning a business. To your point, I wasn't taught about 401ks and that kind of thing. So I understand where you're coming from, and I would imagine that's probably true for a lot, I won't say all, but a lot of um, black families. Do you agree, Jay? Absolutely. I think part of that is a tribute to the regular conversation at, at the table. I mean, a lot of, I would say, people of color don't sit down at a table and have dinner or breakfast or lunch, for that matter, when they have that time available. Most people go grab their meals and go to a room mm -hmm. or go to the living room, and sometimes they don't have that much room to sit 
and discuss these things. And as far as regular conversation, or if you're in the car, you know, you talk, a lot of people will talk music, but you'll find a lot of other families will mix in things of talking about uh, wealth in some form or another. Like she said, taking care of your house, that is a form of a wealth. You keep it up, it's going to be a future right. for you. Right. Um, right. You're talking about a 401k. We're talking about what is Social Security. Some mm -hmm. people think that things are old to them mm -hmm. or talking about the news on what happens. That regular conversation is important, mm -hmm. very important, because how do you transfer that information down? Um, your first learning experience from a child to a, to, um, a, from a parent to a child is right there to learn everything. And if you're not just talking about school, you, gotta, you shouldn't be just talking about school. You should talk mm -hmm. about your future and future as far as right. money. I think you're spot on, but uh, again, we just don't get that. We don't get that kind of conversation with our parents. Um, I would say that you know you, that music uh, is a big part of our conversation. Would you agree? And mm -hmm. you know, spending and buying and uh, and things like that. So um, that I believe is part of the problem, if you will. So uh, let's move on. The, the black-white wealth gap today is a result of decades of wealth inequality in the U.S. Now, there's a 2020 Brook Brookings study that said that white households account for 84% of the wealth in the United States, while black households account for just 4%. Hmm. 84% versus 4%. So again, and we're talking about this, but something is wrong with that picture, and I think we hit on that, but let's delve a little deeper into what's wrong with that picture. So coming from the, the profession of healthcare, I, I bet each of you know somebody who has had a health challenge or someone in their family who's had a health challenge mm -hmm. where they've had bills they couldn't pay. Mm -hmm. So imagine the impact of having a health scare or a health crisis and either you're not getting adequate care because you don't have insurance, mm -hmm. you're not able to pay your bills because you don't have insurance, or you're not even engaged in preventative care so that you can prevent a serious outcome. And so how often are we seeing, and even moved by the tragedy, for example, of Chadwick Boseman? Here's somebody who had enormous wealth, enormous prestige, but in, in, a, in a very private way, dealt with a very major crisis that impacts black men throughout our community and maybe even missed an opportunity to drive that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so if we can look at it from both a micro and a macro perspective, what we're taught about how to take care of ourselves, how to manage our health, how to afford the medications, how to maintain our balance, mm -hmm. All those things play a role. And then on top of it, if you don't have a sense of the value of property, the value of real estate, the value of a savings, or even yeah. understand what company matching mm -hmm. is about with your 401k, mm -hmm. are you taking advantage of the resources that may be available to you? Right. Do you want to add anything to that? Because I have a a, a deep personal question I want to present to you, but do you want to add something to that? I think that? she had <clears throat> mentioned just about everything. I think um, a lot of those things are preventative. Those conversations mm -hmm. that you have early, early on about your your health, about health is wealth. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you have your health, that is that's worth a lot <clears throat> as far as value and as far as those early conversations. Right. That's very important and taking advantage of those educational opportunities. Right. Right, I agree. I mean, if you, what good is wealth if you're not healthy and you right. can't, you know, uh, have fun with the wealth? <laughs> so, but let's back up a little bit because you all just sound too perfect to me, you know? <laughs> so, when you first got married, come on now, married couples have issues with money, and most of them do. Now, y'all could be just totally different. I don't know, but I, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, who, usually there's one person in the, in the group who who spends too much, the other one likes to save. So what you know what happened in your marriage? I mean, how did y'all jump over that gap we, right we there? We had a we had an interesting kind of beginning because um, we we learned to serve, save little, so we would save our change, mm -hmm. and 
actually when we were we had we paid for our own wedding. It was a small wedding. We mm-hmm. didn't do a grandiose wedding. Mm-hmm. We actually had a wedding for under fifteen hundred dollars. Um, we had jars of uh, of change that we used to pay our first month's rent in the place that we moved into mm-hmm. after we got married. Um, but we didn't have a lot of experience in managing finances as a married couple. So we stumbled a lot. We, we made some stupid mistakes. We, instead of fixing cars, we bought other cars. Mm-hmm. And can you imagine you, you buy a car and you don't have money down and you get into an upside down loan because you didn't have enough money to put on the car that you thought you really had to have. Yes. And so we did, we made those kind of mistakes. Uh, didn't necessarily understand the importance of not bouncing a check. Mm -hmm. So we made those mistakes. And I think what drew us into this conversation much, much deeper was after we got married, Jay's dad uh, had lung cancer, was diagnosed with lung cancer. And so to to watch uh, that path that, that he had to be on with his father, and, and then how they were figuring out how his mother was going to make it, where was she going to live. Mm-hmm. It forced us to get serious about some of that stuff a little sooner than we probably would have. Right, right. That That's, <laughs> well, at least, you know, we know that you you were normal. Yes, mm-hmm. very much so. <laughs> Made big mistakes. I, I know my first husband and I got married during college. We had absolutely nothing. <laughs> Parents didn't want us to get married. We went ahead, and we were flat broke, uh, you know, from Jump Street, and building wealth was never a part of the conversation because, you know, I guess we were running on love, and that soon ran out. Oh, my. I mean, it ran all the way out 10 years later, but anyway. Uh, so, you know, we, it's always robbing Peter to, to pay Paul, and um, I just wondered, you know, after you you said that you— uh, started taking care of his father. So, and and you started. I guess the light came on then in 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 your minds. Um, so, is that when you st- started thinking about really building wealth and how important it was, Jay? We had advice, you know, people telling us what we should be doing. Um, I worked with a coworker, and she would uh, mention that you guys, you know, you guys are really young, and. Um, before you start spending all this newfound wealth, because I had started working for the university soon after we got married, and she would say, you know, you guys need to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And we would listen, but we were young. And most young marriages, they think that they're old. She was like a big sister to us, so it was Mm kind of like, boy, I hear my big sister again (laughs) telling me what to do. Um, But, um, and again, she would repeat it. But then, you know, we heard from our pastor say the same thing. And he uh, and during the time that we would buy these new cars, mm-hmm. no delayed gratification. And he would see it and say, those are nice cars you got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got somewhere to park that car <laughs> that you own? Mm-hmm. And he said, don't buy more than a car that you don't have a place to park it. And so with repeated messages of a coworker, it's like, wow, it's, I would tell my wife, well, some of this stuff is making sense. So maybe we should start listening. Maybe we should start um, looking into buying a house. Um, and we start, and that's when the light bills start hitting. Um, and we start talking about it, but mm-hmm. it really didn't manifest until we came to Charlotte. Right, right. So that was great, great advice that they were giving you. So many of us are buying cars. I mean, we stay in debt with cars all of our lives. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And uh, I, I just really believe, like you, that that's something that needs to change in our minds. Yeah. You know, we can, if we can get to the same place in a car that runs, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, especially if we don't have a place, to your point, Jay, to park the car, then we need to keep driving that car. Yeah. And so uh, I agree with you. So, so I hear you talking about buying a house and homes. So tell us, you know, what exactly you are doing to build wealth. It sounds like you're in the real estate. Is that correct? So give us a little, uh, some, some background about that and what you're doing and how that's um, impacting you right now. So Jay mentioned his coworker. His coworker mm-hmm. would say, um, 
things. She would ask us questions about what we did over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And we were pretty content with it. We went to the movies or we went out to eat or we went horseback riding mm -hmm. or something like that. We thought we were doing something. And and she would we'd ask her, of course, reciprocate, what did you do? And she said, uh, I closed on another house. Mm -hmm. She kept saying things like this so often that finally we asked, mm -hmm. how many houses do you have? And I think at that time it was like 26 or 27. Ooh. Now, this is a woman of color in Columbus, Ohio, who just told me that she gave her daughter, as a graduation gift, a house. Well, my dad used to tease me when we would drive across the country, and he'd point at a shanty shack and say, that's what I'm going to get for you, baby girl, I'm going to get that. <laughs> but when we got, when we got married and, and, and after we lost Jay's dad, um, we started really investing time in learning about the real estate industry and learning about how to buy a house and how many ways you can buy a house. Mm -hmm. And many of us are taught there's only one way. You go to the bank, you get a loan, you have a huge down payment, and then you get a house. Well, we learned differently. We learned that you can get into a house multiple ways. You can use many resources. There are many types of loans you can get. You can get lease to own options. You can get uh, buying out of foreclosure. You can get tax foreclosure. So we, we use some of those methodologies to talk our way into our first house. We negotiated it over the phone, and it it was so it, it happened so easily that it almost scared. It's like this can't be real. But after we were successful getting into our first house, then we bought a few more and uh, okay. blessed with blessed with the opportunity to maintain it in spite of just living life and trying to manage. Okay. But we we were blessed, but we were also invested in learning and how to and managing and then learning from our mistakes as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you leveraged the first house. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how many houses do you own now? <laughs> A few here and there. A few here and there. Come on. <laughs> so you but you would say that you are uh, building generational wealth Absolutely. With, through real estate in your Absolutely. your purchases. Well, and and it's not just real mm -hmm. estate mm -hmm. because uh, as we learned better, we did better. So mm -hmm. we started being smarter with matching funds with 401k, Absolutely. with mm -hmm. um, making sure we were putting stuff back and looking at the multiple ways that you can make investments so that you were building. But we also understood the responsibility to invest back in our houses mm -hmm. so that they maintain value. They didn't become an eyesore or what you would consider, you know, those kind of toxic landlords mm -hmm. that don't help a neighborhood. But the other piece to that is we believed in investing in our own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So neighborhoods like the ones I grew up in in Detroit and he grew up in in Cleveland, mm -hmm. in neighborhoods that typically we don't even drive through when we think we're doing better. Mm -hmm. So that was important because I think that that's the key for African Americans to truly build wealth is to build it in communities where we can teach it to one another and hopefully don't get gentrified out of those same mm -hmm. communities. Yep, yep. Do you agree with that, Absolutely. Jay? Yeah. And I think the, the good thing about it is um, the neighbors that we've made there, we've, um, as we go and work on those places, they become like our, our neighbors that we see often. So that we go, when we go and work and mm -hmm. keep those places up, they become our neighbors that we um, keep in contact mm -hmm. over the years. Okay, uh, that's wonderful. So many people, though, uh, I think are flipping houses. That's what they called, and they get into a lot of trouble doing mm -hmm. that. So, that's that wasn't our plan. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, the the goal was, cr by being able to provide good quality homes for people like us to live in. Um, where you're able to work with people who might not always get considered for that house, um, may have had some, you know, kind of shady issues in the past, but they're working through it. Those are the kind of people we want to serve. Mm -hmm. And so we've been true to that, and I think there's been a bit of a, a, a divine intersection with that as well, because I don't think we do any of this on our own. Yep. Yep. And at the same time, um, just a commitment to uh, looking at this as another form of retirement income, mm -hmm. not just an instant income, but something that we can continue to draw an income off of after we stop working. I love it, love it. So let's back up a little bit. We, we're talking about now intergenerational wealth. Mm -hmm. let's, let's look at that for a moment. We've touched on it, but one of the persistent ways the wealth gap continues to be perpetuated is through the lack of inheritance. Mm -hmm. White households are substantially more likely to receive inheritance 
and inheritance than black households. Um, and so why, you know, why do you suppose this is true? And tell us, I think you have a daughter. I mean, tell us, you know, uh, uh, whether the fact that you have a child uh, is important for you in terms of leaving something behind. Oh, gosh, absolutely. Um, my parents didn't talk about finances with us. And when they inherited, actually inherited land mm -hmm. from their families, they didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Paying the taxes, uh, going and checking on it, uh, th those things seemed like a, a big deal, but they really weren't. But they lost lots of land mm -hmm. by simply not paying the taxes. And then when we would ask about it, unfortunately, we were kids, and so mm -hmm. as many of our parents would do, that's, that's grown folks' business, you mind your business. Uh -huh. And so that, that really did kind of create a barrier, and I don't think it was unique to my family. I think a lot of our families had some of those, mm -hmm. what goes on in this house stays in this house, and you don't ask grown folks, grown folks' business. And those are the kind of conversations that we need to be having more often. I, <clears throat> I second that, particularly the part of not knowing, the education part of it. Um, as far as my dad, he had a sixth grade education, and I think my mom had a, a tenth grade education. Um, not that that stopped them from being able to make sure <clears throat> that they paid bills and everything on time, but it's just that it was a lack of information and the discussion with the kids mm -hmm. about things that they should have had those type of conversations on planning for the future and planning for the hereafter after me is, is generational wealth. Because if you don't set that up, that means that your kids become behind before they even yep. get out the, the starting gate. So most other families, they set their families up, not just mm -hmm. for college, but for their first home, yes. or when you get married, or mm -hmm. your, um, your first car, yep. I mean, or college. We've discussed with our child, and she is doing very well. I am, I'm, I'm more impressed than I Thought I would be, <laughs> really, because we said, if you don't get a scholarship, you're going to have to pay for your first two years, and you do not want to own, have a loan when you get out. You won't be able to buy a, a, a car um, inexpensive. It's going to affect your credit, and you won't be able to buy a house. You know this house you're helping us work on mm -hmm. to keep up? You won't be able to get one of these. And mm. so she is making very good efforts to save. And She's so, already gotten her first year and a half covered. Yes. Wow. And and it was and, and so sometimes you know kids who are blessed, mm -hmm. you know they're they're waiting for somebody to roll out a red carpet. Yes, for them. yes. And she had a bit of that mindset, mm -hmm. and so it hindered her from getting awards that she would have otherwise received because mm -hmm. she was just a little late to the table. And you know when when I was in school, I remember my guidance counselor assuming that the best I was going to be was a nurse aide mm -hmm. and telling wow. me so. So, of course, that was the first person I thought about when I walked across that stage and grabbed that piece of pigskin is, is a look at me now kind of thing. But for her, we want her to understand that the loans won't go away until you pay them off. Mm -hmm. And until we get the government to do something about that, uh, many people like me, are carrying that kind of weight. So it's, it's a it's an ongoing conversation, but it also goes back to how little our community has been provided in, in just the basics, the basic financial knowledge, the, the basics of how to prepare, mm -hmm. what to do, where to go, and then reaching back. Yes. I think we haven't been taught that, but even 45 had help from his father. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's a lot to learn by understanding that. But it, it was also a funny story. I believe, I watched Little House on a Parrot. Mm -hmm. And remember Laura Ingalls, she had a dowry where she kept things where she was planning for her life after she got out of the house. I used to chastise my parents, why can't I have one of those? They said, if you want to, there's a garage. You can put anything <laughs> you want in there. But things like that, yeah. we don't yeah. think about, but mm -hmm. they're valid. Yeah, I agree. That is wonderful. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, if you have a talk to your daughter about that and she's listening, mm -hmm. and that is amazing. And mm -hmm. I think we need to do more of that in our families. So let's, uh, I've got just a couple more questions. So Sorry. I'm going to make this statement and I bo want both of you to respond. Black family disorganization is a cause of the racial wealth gap. Black family disorganization is a cause of the racial wealth gap. And let me just explain while you're thinking of your answers. 
Okay, uh, you know, there are substantial differences in living arrangements of children by race and ethnicity. This is research I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about. Most white and Asian American children still are being raised by two-parent households and 55% of Latino children as well. Now, in sharp contrast, only 31% of black children are living with two married parents, while more than half, or 54%, are being raised by a single parent. So this is what I mean by disorganization of the black family. Just respond to that, if you will. I think it's systemic, and it was intentional. And so we can go back to public policy uh, from the time of slavery to present date where it was the design to separate the black man from the black woman and to make it harder for us to succeed and to make it harder for uh, a, a struggling couple, a poor couple, a poorly educated couple to get a break. And so you look at the number of people who are in prison, you look at the number of people with, with uh, first time offender, second time offender, three strikes and you're out kind of mindset. And uh, I think that was the intentional design. I don't think that was something intended by black people. Right, but Jay, do you think that we should address that, you know, in, in a different way maybe than, than the way that we are addressing it in, in the black community? What's, what's your thought on that? Um, I think, I think uh, there's a lot of factors that go into um, trying to address it because I don't think you could have a single approach to addressing um, a single parent home. I think, um, I think addressing that um, not just come from um, criminal background or um, how the role models are needed when you don't have, um, when you have a single parent home, role models are needed to fill in those gaps or to have more of a community as we used to have growing up um, it, um, where it would take a community to raise a family and not just, um, even if it was a single parent, you had other people that would step in to help with those families. Well, one, of, one, <clears throat> one problem um, that I'm reading about is that there are not enough marriageable black men to go around. What do y'all think about oh that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> First and foremost, again, I think the statements like that are meant to disparage and punish, if not blame, black people. And um, there is very good reason in looking at those numbers and looking the, at outcomes to consider the conversation of reparations. Because you can't come out of the history that we've survived and, ne and only, what, in recent days and weeks are we starting to acknowledge truths that we have buried and done everything to hide from the general public. I think that it's criminal that we continue to look down our nose at the outcomes and not take some responsibility for where we go from here. Spot on, spot on. So one, one final um, question, and this is a quiz, so I want you to uh -uh. You know, pick the right answer. So if current trends continue, Jay and Alicia, how long will it take the average black household to accumulate as much wealth as white households today, okay? A, 100 years, B, 25 years, C, 228 years, or D, 75 years. How long will it take us to catch up with white households if, if things continue the way they are going now in the black community? Based on the way that you asked that question, uh -huh. based on current trends, uh -huh. C. C, 228 years. I Do you agree, agree with that? Absolutely, because okay. of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> so what's the right answer? The right answer is 228 years. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, you know, research shows that if the average black family wealth continues to grow at the same pace it has over the past three decades, it will take black families 228 years to amass the same amount of wealth white families have today. Now, this is just 17 years shorter than the 245 year span of slavery that we endured. Mm -hmm. Because it never ended. 
Right. We're still enslaved. Yes, until mm -hmm. you start to own the truth about the, the criminality of slavery and the impact on an entire people and the way that people were taught to see us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no matter what our hue is, mm -hmm. that negative, it's going to take more to undo it. And it has to be an active. So it can't be current trends. It's got to be new trends. Absolutely. Okay, so let's close. So I want each of you to, or both of you to, um, to state very succinctly, what, what advice would you give the black community right now with regard to building health? One sentence, wealth. What would you say is the most important thing? Well, I would say they have to, um, I would say um, that if someone wanted to try to build wealth, they have to own their own destiny. I mean, own that I really want this. And no matter what, try to um, try to learn from someone else, um, but own your destiny no matter where you're at. Mm -hmm. Because even if you, even if you're unemployed, you can own your own destiny. Continue to try to strive for where you're going, but also learn for what you need to do to prepare for the future. And delayed gratification is a very big thing. Don't say you have to have everything today. Um, you know, it's something for you tomorrow. Don't say you have to go and buy a new car today. Buy the, the, um, the used car, but still save for the future. Love it, love it. Alicia? Um, there is power in unity. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when we start to work together, we will be able to do more than we can on our own. And if we look at the, the examples that Asian Americans mm -hmm. and Hispanic Americans have provided us that we've been able to witness, when they work together, mm -hmm. they drive mm -hmm. outcomes. When they work separately, they, they seem to be uh, kind of in a silo. Mm -hmm. And so I, I see that that's kind of what we've been taught to do is to do it on our own, but we need to retrain ourselves to see the power in working together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Alicia, uh, this has been a pleasure. Uh, we certainly appreciate your comments. And uh, hopefully the listeners out there, you know, are listening and uh, can learn from uh, your life and your journey to building wealth. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much for taking time. Uh, to come today and to talk about this important subject matter. And so as we say goodbye, always remember, folk, income allows families to get by. Wealth allows families to get ahead. See you next time. Or talk to you next time. I won't see you right on a podcast. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.